So let's talk about Cubism, one of the most difficult to define art movements, but we're going to try anyway. Now, Cubism was one of the most influential visual art styles of the early 20th century. It's going to be created by Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque in Paris between about 1907 and 1914. Now, the French art critic Louis Vauxhall, who has turned up in the past, will coin the term Cubism after seeing the landscapes Braque had painted in 1908 in emulation of Cézanne. Vauxhall will call the geometric forms in highly abstracted works cubes. This is, of course, a misunderstanding. Because what cubism does is it strips all of the elements off of something and rearranges them so that we can better identify. And one of the best examples would be something like, well, for example, your iPhone. After all, your iPhone has elements on it on both sides that are important to identifying the form, the screen on the front, maybe the home button, depending what version you have, the Apple logo and camera on the back. But of course, I can't show both sides at once, can I? Not if I want to depict it only once. So what the cubists will do is they take those individual elements, they study them individually, and then move them. So maybe the Apple logo and the camera move to the front along with the screen. And we see this in these images. Now, these are uh, self-portraits by Picasso throughout his life. And what you see is on the left, a fairly straightforward self-portrait, something we would recognize. It's all based on proportions and relationships. The relationship between the eyes and between the eyes and the nose and the nose and the mouth and all of that. If you've studied art, you're familiar with breaking down the form into these various lines so that you know where things sit. But by the time he gets to his cubist form in the middle, you'll notice, for example, that the eyes are not equal. That's because Picasso is studying one eye and then the other, completely independent of one another. And their placement on the face is not in relation to anything else on the face. So they can actually turn up elsewhere as we see in his very late work. They don't even have to turn up in the same uh, direction that you would commonly expect. The nose here has gotten much larger. He sees it as very prominent. And you'll see it's simplified, once again, primarily seen in profile because, of course, that's the most recognizable form. Whereas over here, it's actually done from below and you're looking at the nostrils. The mouth, again, has no relation to the rest of the face other than it sits fairly low. And we see the same thing over here where the mouth has actually been turned. The line of the jaw is most interesting from the side. So he kind of distorts it and moves it over. Whereas here he's focusing on the line of the cheek and the jaw is completely irrelevant. Whereas typically you would have that line of the cheek and line of the jaw depicted on both sides. So what they're doing is they're taking these individual characteristics, the characteristics that are most identifiable to whatever the form is, and they're moving them around as necessary to give us a better impression of what we're looking at. This is an experiment. How do people look at things? How do people characterize and identify things? Now, other influences on early Cubism have been linked to primitivism and non-Western sources. What is primitivism? Well, it's the search for simpler, more basic ways, uh, a simpler, more basic way of life away from Western urban sophistication and social restrictions. So they're looking at primitive forms to replace the things that they already know. Now, what we're going to see is a stylization and distortion in Picasso's groundbreaking works, such as La Moselle d'Avion which we're going to look at later, painted in 1907. And these forms will come primarily from African art in the form of African masks. Now, how does he know about them? Well, Picasso more than likely first saw African art when in May or June of 1907, he visited the Ethnographic Museum in the Palais de Trocadero in Paris. Now, the thing that you need to understand is when he walked into that museum, he would have seen masks, well, very similar to the way you're seeing them here. No labels, no understanding of what they are. After all, the French are just sort of picking them up. They're going, ha ha, I, 
I seem to have found a mask. I, I think it has meaning. I take it back. And they put it in the museum and they assign meaning to it. In fact, they often leave it up to the viewer to assign meaning to. And so Picasso looks at them as depicting sort of a air of primitive innocence as well as uh, innocent sexuality and innocent energy. Things that are related to some of his later paintings. Now, the Cubist painters also rejected the inherent concept that art should copy nature or that artists should adopt the traditional techniques of perspective, modeling, and foreshadowing, foreshortening, excuse me. Instead, they wanted to emphasize the two-dimensionality of the canvas. So they reduced and fractured objects into geometric forms and then realigned them within a shallow relief-like space. Here you're seeing a study, for example, of a violin. So they're also using multiple or contrasting vantage points. Remember my example of the iPhone. That's exactly what they're doing. So you're looking at things from different directions at the same time. By the way, in doing so, they actually capture time because you can't look at something from different directions at the same time. For example, your cell phone, it takes time, quite literally takes time to turn it around so that you can see what's on the back. And so they're capturing time as well as capturing these different identifiable elements laid out in a different form on their canvas. So in cubist work, up to 1910, the subject of a picture is usually fairly discernible. Here we know this is a guitar. Although figures and objects were dissected or analyzed into a multitude of small facets, these were then reassembled after a fashion to evoke those same figures or objects. Through primarily associated, sorry, excuse me, though primarily associated with uh, painting, Cubism also exerted a profound influence on the 20th century in sculpture and architecture. We'll see Cubist design turning up in futurism and other forms. The liberating formal concepts initiated by Cubism also had far-reaching consequences for Dada and Surrealism, as well as for all artists pursuing abstraction in Germany, Holland, Italy, England, America, and Russia. So this is going to be an incredibly important movement, an incredibly important set of ideas, which is why I've spent so much time trying to explain what cubism is.